Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for another installment of the research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of Michigan Virtual, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. Michigan Virtual's efforts include providing online courses to K-12 students across Michigan and the United States, as well as providing a variety of professional learning opportunities for educators focused on innovative educational practices such as blended learning, providing resources, products, and services to personalize learning options for their students, and improve student achievement. Today, we are joined by quite a few collaborators on a recent publication. And because we have so many of them, I am going to abstain from doing introductions and allow them to introduce themselves and hand it right over to our presenters. So thank you. Well, well thank you. So I'm Sean Lancaster. Um, I'm at Grand Valley State University, a public school in Michigan. And I'll let our other collaborators introduce themselves. Mark. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Deshane. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership in the College of Education and Human Services at Central Michigan University. And Kelsey, you might have to turn your microphone or your speakers up to hear her. Okay. Can you hear me? It's very hard to hear you. Hello, my name is Kelsey Ortiz. I'm with the University of Kansas. I'm the Research Project Coordinator, and I work with Special Education and the Policy and Initiative. And then we also have um, Daryl Mellard, also at the University of Kansas. And back in the 1990s, he was my PhD advisor. And oh, and Mary has now joined us. Mary, does your microphone work? I think it does. Can you hear me? Sure. You want to just quickly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Mary Rice, and I am a professor of literacy um, at the University of New Mexico. And I worked at the Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities for four years, and um, before I took my new position. And I am really glad to be here today. Yeah, and you're just starting this fall, I think, at the University of New Mexico. That's right. That's right. Good weather so far. All right. <laughs> yeah. So the, the talk we're going to talk about is the current policies and the provision of special education services in fully online statewide schools. And let me turn my speakers down. Uh, the, these proposed activities that we looked at, we were identifying how states support cyber school students who have special education needs. And because this charge came from the state of Michigan, we were also looking at the specifically policies in other states. And so when I say policies, we went far beyond that to try and get at what was happening in these states. And that's looking at logistical monitoring funding policy and the various practices that come together when you look at students with disabilities entering online schools. Oops. All right. And so when we talk about online schools, uh, online education can take on a whole bunch of different forms. It could be a classroom teacher who is doing a hybrid lesson. Maybe they flip their classroom. It could be online credit recovery, which is very common in many high schools. Um, but what we were looking at specifically was students who were enrolled full time in a cyber school, so students with disabilities. Um, and when you look at this, there are so many variables that come into play. And some of that will come through in our research. Um, but there's just a lot of different people that um, participate in the education of students with disabilities and all of their related services. And so that creates a lot of um, complications to the process, whether you're in a virtual school or not. And so um, these are the little things that we had to try and address as we went through our uh, research. 
Um, we noticed as we started looking at all of the other states that the most common way for cyber schools to operate in the K-12 environment is through virtual charter schools. And so that was the case, I think, in just about every state we looked at. Um, and as you know about charter schools, they aren't, they're still publicly funded, but they don't have the same regulations as public schools in many cases. Um, and so we had to work with staff and policy makers and people who were worked in state departments trying to look at how policies developed for traditional public schools then get applied in cyber school settings. And so that sort of introduces our work. Um, if, since we're dealing with students with disabilities, just a quick look at um, the laws surrounding students with disabilities because this is what really gave our charge sort of its backbone. And the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA of 2004, provides legal, um, it's the law for uh, uh, educating students with disabilities. So it tells states and local providers what the responsibilities are uh, regarding education and related services. It also ensures that all students with a disability are entitled to a free, appropriate public education. And so FAPE will come up um, many times throughout our talk today, and so that's what it means, the free and appropriate public education. So regardless of where students are, they are still entitled to an education and support services, and we'll get more into that. And so I think this is, Mary's going to talk about this, I believe. So you might need to turn your speakers up. Mary? All right. I think Mary's having difficulty. Um, Mary, Kelsey, and Daryl Mallard all worked at the center on online learning and students with disabilities at the University of Kansas. Um, Mary has since moved on to the University of New Mexico, but the work that they did that sort of got this organization selected by the state of Michigan was work in 2016 where they looked at challenges for students with disabilities in online and virtual charter schools. So this was more at a granular level. Um, and they noted a whole bunch of challenges that exist for these students, um, from slow review of IEP once the student's placement changes, to difficulty in providing related services or making curricular adjustments. Um, and so all of these things come into play when we look at the big statewide policies. So let's, let's see here. Um, there is no national law or federal education law for how students with disabilities should be educated in cyber schools. However, the Office of Special Education Programs in 2016 sent out a Dear Colleague letter. You can see a little snippet of that on the slide here. Um, but this was where OSEP tried, and they sent this out to state directors of education, or state departments of education, and they tried to lay out what state education agencies and local education agencies need to um, address as they provide these education for students with disabilities in charter schools or virtual charter schools. So there's supervisor responsibilities for ensuring implementation. There's child find services to find students with disabilities both before they enter a virtual charter school while they're in it and after they participated in online learning environments. And then they wanted to make sure that the assurances of FAPE were happening in the least restrictive environment. And that doesn't mean that a student who chooses, with a disability who chooses to go into an online or a cyber school um, is told that this is not the least restrictive environment. You must go back to your resident school district. It means if the student has selected the virtual school, that you find a way to do that in the least restrictive way. I keep hitting my arrow keys to extend. All right, so Mark. Thank you, Sean. 
As Sean uh, said at the beginning of the webinar, Michigan is an interesting place as far as financing and landscaping of, of services for students with disabilities. Uh, Michigan has a very strong tradition of local control where local governments, local education agencies, uh, and intermediate school districts take a large responsibility in the not only oversight and provision of services for students with disabilities, but also in the articulation and the types of services that they're going to offer. And this is traditionally done through the intermediate school district plan. The big challenge we have in Michigan is each in intermediate school district comes up with, with its own plan, and that plan is then submitted to the state. The state then decides as to whether or not this is going to allow for the provision of FAPE in the least restrictive environment or not. And based upon that ISD plan, the ISD, the intermediate school district, uh, sometimes known as an RESA or an RESD, a regional education service agency or a regional education service district, has the ability but not the requirement to go after a special ed millage within their intermediate school district to pay for the provision of those services that they have listed in the ISD plan. Well, because of the uh, discontinuity across the state, there are pockets of rather extensive amounts of programming for students with disabilities, and there are areas that aren't as extensive. And I think that was what really led uh, this investigation, is how do you take a state like Michigan with such a diversity of funding mechanisms and supports and pull things together in a way that makes sense from a compliance as well as a uh, provision of funding supports. So one of the things that uh, we were asked to do in Michigan is look at how the state per pupil allocation is impacted by the district of residence of the student with disability. We also needed to uh, look at things such as the ISD plan and to see what their millage rate was. And finally, we wanted to see if uh, the millage rates, if any levy by the uh, school, uh, the student school of residence was similar or commensurate with that of uh, another agency around the area. So we ended up finding quite a bit of, of inconsistencies as we did this initial lay of the land discussion. And that really formed the basis of some of the questions that we started asking as we went across the nation. So Michigan's Public School Act, uh, PA 8, uh, 108 of 2017, has been recently been reauthorized. Uh, Michigan was a, a leader in the area of mandatory special education. We had our first mandatory special education law in Michigan uh, that predated PL 94-142, which was the Education for All Student Handicapped Students uh, Services Act, which was the federal law. And best practice back then in Michigan was to take and provide educational services for all students with disabilities. That included the students that had the most significant or profound disabilities. And because of that, center-based programs were built and Michigan was seen as a leader in the provision of the development, provision of services and the development of segregated facilities. But you have to remember in the time in which that was happening, this was before the uh, massive civil rights push for normalization and integration of people with disabilities into society. So Michigan developed an awful lot of very extensive resources across the state through the inter immediate school district funding mechanism, and many of those systems and programs still exist today. Michigan has long relied on intermediate school districts as the vehicle or the organization of choice for funding to flow through through as being a fiduciary agent or through the uh, issue of compliance and monitoring for the provision of special ed services. Intermediate school districts also are responsible for looking at things such as uh, the certification and areas of approval for special ed services for a lot of the people that are working with kids with disabilities or young adults with disabilities in their region. All right, so I just now noticed that there's a chat 
um, window. I'm not paying attention to that as I talk, and I apologize. Dennis, I see your question. We looked at all cyber schools that serve students with disabilities to answer your question. Um, so when we, when we started our research, we first engaged in a national policy scan using these two research questions. So that is, what are the existing state policies regarding the provision and payment of special education services for students enrolled full-time in virtual schools? And then what are the challenges for special education service delivery that have um, emerged from these different administrative and funding configurations? And so to engage in this work, we followed um, the steps you see here, and this is a, really an a oversimplification, but um, we, it was very time consuming to just identify all of the states that have full-time virtual schools. So we might, we could look at state um, Department of Education websites. Um, you could do a search, a Google search looking for cyber schools or virtual charter schools or virtual schools um, and in the state name. Um, so you can see how this can get very complicated. And there were some states we weren't sure. So for example, one of the states that was on my call list was um, Alaska. And you would think with the big rural uh, coverage that they have in that state that virtual um, or cyber schools would be very prevalent, but they don't have any. They do offer courses that are online. So I might be in a rural area and I need trigonometry and I can take that online, but most of my education still occurs in my resident school district. And so after a lengthy conversation with Alaska, we could cross them off of our list and not um, analyze data that we collect from Alaska, although they still have education happening there for students with disabilities in online environments. Um, it's not their full-time placement. Um, we engaged in data collection. So once we knew the states that we were going to be um, interacting with, then we called people in the state, we emailed people, we connected with people in the states, um, key players who could provide us the information that we needed. We analyzed the data, and then we had some verification, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, but that was sort of the process we followed. Um, some of the limitations that we encountered, um, it's very difficult in some cases to find somebody who knows about the state policies um, in all of the different states. Sometimes I would contact a state and I would be given another name and then I would wait a few days and that person would call me back and tell me that I needed to talk to somebody else or that they knew part of it but that somebody else would have to complete uh, the whole knowledge base for that state. And so we had a lot of difficulty in trying to get um, all of the information we wanted. And I should point out that we conducted this research from May through into well into July. And our final report was then done um, by July 31st. And so this is the va um, summer vacation for a lot of uh, school personnel and education personnel. So if somebody was on a nine-month contract, we could have just missed them. Um, but we did manage to contact most of the states that were included. Um, we had diff um, we didn't have the time to verify what we were learning about policy and how it plays out at the actual school level. And so there was no way for us to verify that the policy was playing out accurately in all of the different schools around a state, for example, or in all of the different uh, virtual schools. And so that's uh, uh, beyond the research that we did. Um, th as you know from the introductions, this was a collaborative effort. Um, there were five of us engaged in this research. We each had a number of states that we had to contact. And so that could be uh, limiting, but we made sure to contact and have uh, weekly conference calls. We had a Google Doc that we were working on together so that we could ask questions. If we encountered something that seemed to be an outlier, then people could ask follow-up questions. We could go back to the individual we got the original data from and get clarifying uh, information. So. By working together, we had sort of a checks and balances on each other that I think helped this work. Um, but we also did member checks. So once we collected data and started analyzing it, and then we kind of synthesized it or summarized it, we would go back to the states and talk with the people we had talked to originally to get the data and ask them if we were still accurately reflecting the conversation that we had with these individuals. 
Um, and then I guess one of the final limitations is that these policies can change. It's a very dynamic um, field, so to speak. Like I spoke with people in Wisconsin, and they have a model set up where a student with a disability has funding that goes to the resident school district. When that student chooses a virtual or a cyber school, then the funding that goes from the resident district to the cyber school used to be a true cost model. So if this student with a disability costs more than student B with a disability, student A would get more money, student B would get less money to the virtual charter school. Um, but that was a little, I guess they determined that was too complicated. Um, and so they went to a, um, a flat rate. And so then every student with a disability took the same amount of funding with them to the online uh, cyber school. And obviously that created problems too, because not all children with disabilities cost the same for their education. And so as I spoke with the people on the phone, they had been doing this new model for a year, and they were already ready to shift back to what they had done previously with the true cost model. And so when I say that this is um, an evolving experience with policies, it's constantly evolving. And so the work we did is really a snapshot of the summer of 2017, but summer of 2018 could look different. All right, so we're going to go into some of our findings. So again, the research questions, what are the policies regarding the provision and payment, and then what are the challenges that emerged from the different models we found? Um, so as we looked at that first research question, we, it really broke down into two different avenues for investigation. One was how are special education services funded, and then who ensures that a free and appropriate public education is taking place. And it seems like those would go together, but we quickly found that it can be very different in many different states. So the funding model, there were four different models that states engaged in for funding. And you can see those on here. One is special education funding flows directly to the charter school from the state. And so there's seven states that apply there. And as you go through, if you think red states and blue states, there's no pattern that emerges. And everybody's trying every different model, it seems. Um, a second was special education funding flows directly to the charter school through a state's charter authorizing agency. And so there's an, uh, six states there. There's also models where special education funding flows from the resident school district, so where the child currently lives, into the um, virtual charter school. And so you can see the four states there, including Michigan, that Mark talked about. And then finally, there's special education funding flows to the school district in which the virtual school has been assigned. So for example, I had Wisconsin and Kansas on my a call list in Kansas, only public schools districts can authorize charter schools. So that means that only public school districts can authorize virtual charter schools as well. And so in those states, the funding flowed, or flowed to the resident school district and then was given to the virtual school. And as I mentioned, this question had two different avenues that we pursued. The second was, who ensures that FAPE is happening? And so there were three different configurations for ensuring the FAPE responsibility. It could be that it's the student's resident school district that has to ensure that uh, free and appropriate that is carrying out the IEP. It could be the virtual charter school or authorizer of the virtual school. So a, a host of states fell under that model. Or in Nevada, they negotiated responsibilities between the resident district and the virtual charters. Um, if you want to see how these two models fit together, I promise you I'm not a graphic artist, as professional as this image looks. Um, but this shows how complicated and interwoven the different models and solutions that states are trying to uh, accomplish. And I'll leave that up there for a second. On the left-hand side is that first part of research question one, who, how is special education funded in virtual schools? 
And then on the right-hand side is who's um, responsible for ensuring the free and appropriate public education. All right, and so the second research question is, what challenges have emerged from these funding configurations? And so Mark's going to talk about some of the, uh, the, the example of Michigan, and then we'll move on. Thank you very much. One of the interesting things with the wide variety of supports and services available for students with disabilities in a local area uh, is that Michigan is very rural in areas, very urban in other areas, and we have pockets of wonderful resources and opportunities for services in some, whereas parents in other parts of the state need to travel considerable distances to be afforded the same types of opportunities. And one of the interesting things that emerged when we were looking at Michigan is um, we have a situation where parents who are advocating more strongly at a local level for their son or daughter with disability might not have the resources available locally. So one of the things based on the way that the law has recently been promulgated is the ISD where the charter school is domiciled is responsible for the provision of, of services and for uh, compliance and funding for that student enrolled, for students with disabilities enrolled in that charter school, regardless of where they exist or where they reside in the state. So for example, if you have a charter school in an area that's very, an urban area that's very heavily populated, and that's where most of them are, and where those intermediate school districts or RESDs, RESAs, tend to have higher funding because of higher uh, revenues generated through the ISD millage for special education, you could have a student, pardon me, you could have a parent of, of a child in a district that has very low provision of services, enroll their son or daughter in that charter school, and the ISD where that charter school is domiciled will then be responsible for the provision of services in literally anywhere in the state. So that's got some kind of interesting uh, policy implications for it. The other thing that we are interested in is this whole idea of um, having to provide things such as uh, services, medical services, uh, transition services, and the like. These related services have the potential of being incredibly expensive. And one of the things that we uh, might end up seeing is because of the ability of local regions to, to give services, you might not have a educational-based model for a medical intervention available in a local area and the charter school then would have to provide maybe a with pardon me contract with a local hospital for the provision of that service and we might end up seeing more of a medical model orientation for some of these contracted services as opposed to an educational model now that might sound a little um, specific and a little um, remote, but that's a huge challenge that schools have in the provision of, of uh, alternative, serve, pardon me, of ancillary supports and services for kids with disabilities is whether or not what we are doing is educationally necessary and relevant versus a being medically uh, necessary and relevant. And finally, one of the interesting things that is going to happen on a logistical basis for these virtual charter school providers is they have the potential of having to negotiate with many intermediate school districts who may or may not be able to provide uh, the supports or the services or provide the co uh, compliance mechanisms necessary. Some charter schools might end up have actually having to uh, send faculty or staff members to various parts of the state if they're unable to find 
a partner in that region that is going to be able to provide for uh, the students enrolled in their programs in the way that it is necessary. So we've got a very interesting logistical situation that might be creeping upon us based on the new law and the change of policy and direction. All right, thanks, Mark. And Jay, to your point, um, I, I think I'll hit on what you wrote just recently in the comments on this slide here. Um, when we started looking at the challenges that have emerged, one of the challenges we experienced was getting people that we talked to to talk about the challenges that they experienced based on their policies. Um, maybe they were concerned that the comments could be taken out of context, but we didn't get a lot of people that wanted to talk often about uh, the problems they were experiencing other than not enough money to do what they need to do. But, um, but there certainly were reimbursement rate challenges. So to Jay's point about the cybers not getting dollars for special education, um, I talked to a um, authorizer of charter schools in Michigan who noted that getting money from the local school districts could be sometimes as simple as sending a Starbucks gift card to the, the office asking for the money that they needed for the special education services. And so you, they deal with it at the granular level from all of the different ISDs and local school districts that they deal with. So that gets very complicated. Um, let's see. Uh, there's Mark talked about some of the additional costs. I mean, when you're a cyber school dealing with um, occupational therapy services. Oh, somebody's clicking through the slides. Um, that if a school district's doing it, you know they can work with one agency. But if a, a cyber school is doing it, they might have to work with different agencies across all the state um, counties in the state, and so it can get very complicated for them. And that's the same with the various services. Somebody else is clicking the buttons here. Uh, so let's try to get through some. So just quickly what we went through was that the service delivery responsibilities and funding configurations have a lot of overlap. Um, they are viewed very differently by different states' policies. No model that we looked at seemed to be the very best because they all had some strengths and they all had weaknesses. And it was very much a case of we're trying to figure this out as we go along. Um, I noted earlier in our limitations that we weren't able to get down to the level of implementation practices. But you can probably imagine that the way these, these policies impact practice is carried out in very different ways. I wouldn't be surprised to see as much variability within each state as there are, is between each state. Um, we couldn't get at a lot of the nuances um, based on the interview time that we had. Um, even though I followed up with emails and additional phone calls, there was just so much information that we couldn't get to. Um, and I think some conclusions. Um, these are items that policy should be um, should be looking at as they enact policies unique to cyber schools, although many of these things are not unique to cyber schools. So for example, the shared responsibility. Identify the entity with the legal responsibility for ensuring FAPE through policy. That could be the resident district or the ISD or the cyber school. And clearly communicate that information to all interested stakeholders, especially parents because we heard that parents were often left out of what was happening. Um, the funding flow, funding concerns probably aren't a parental concern, as we note. Um, but that's a huge issue for service providers. It's very easy for a service provider working with the um, Grand Rapids Public Schools to know who they're going to each time. But when you start working with a virtual charter school that doesn't control the funding for special education, and so then you're dealing with maybe um, somebody in a resident school district that's trying to get reimbursed, and it's somebody else that controls the funding. It just gets very complicated for those service providers trying to even find who's going to be paying them. Um, IEP reviews, 
um, uh, people noted that special education services, the IEP review, when the change of placement takes place, there needs to be policy for how quickly that IEP review takes place. Um, it's not enough to have a student shift to a cyber school and hope that all of their accommodations and IEP goals and objectives are still relevant to the same degree. And we heard from people that one of the challenges is that sometimes people in cyber schools think that maybe they no longer have to address all of the goals and objectives. So if a student had, let's say, um, social skills, they were hitting other kids in the traditional public school on recess, well, we no longer need to deal with that because now they're being educated from their own home. And so some of those things could create complications for whether IEP goals and objectives still needed to be addressed. Um, data sharing was a big problem that was noted. Um, so how do you get information from the resident school district to the cyber school? And how do you get information from all, from, all the way from parents to service providers, et cetera? Um, all of that could be addressed through policy as well. I think I had this slide twice. And the last thing I think I was going to talk about was professional development. I, I don't think there are very many teacher preparation programs that help um, special education teachers know how to educate students in an online environment, or for that matter, general ed teachers teaching in online environments. Um, so certainly, we could start. Um, addressing kind of how that professional development happens for teachers who teach in cyber schools. And then there's some references, but we can, I think we have time now to open it up for questions. Just to let everyone know that if you would like to pose a question via audio, uh, you can do that if you want to just indicate so in the chat window and I can enable your audio for you. Dennis asked a question if we're considering writing a frequently asked questions for parents of students with disabilities in online schools. Uh, Dennis, that would be an interesting document to produce from my perspective. Uh, it would be very much dependent upon the state that that child would be attending school as far as well as a lot of local considerations. When you look at uh, Sean's wonderful graphic up there with all of those lines that were going back and forth, you have quite an interesting menage of, of opportunity for uh, professional development and support. And I guess what we have found, from my perspective more than anything else, is that we are on such a very interesting base of, of lack of knowledge and a lot of this stuff is very transient in nature. As Sean said earlier, um, there are certain states that uh, we are aware of. Uh, I think Wisconsin is one in particular that he likes to talk about, where they have shifted their funding mechanisms and their compliance requirements two and three times. Because once they started moving something forward and, and attempted to put it into place, they realized that things weren't working the way it needed to. So they went back to the drawing board and revised it. More than anything else, I think what this, this work has, has shown me is we truly are at the infancy in a lot of ways. Uh, and it truly has shown me that technology and our capabilities for technology or utilizing technology as an instructional tool or a tool to differentiate instruction, uh, which is my area of research, um, or to provide access is far outpacing our ability to make sense of it from a political, financial, legislative, legal, practical perspective. If 
it's almost like the wild west of, of provision of service delivery. On a positive note, uh, my experience is as being a teacher and an administrator of special education and a uh, teacher consultant. And I am personally aware of many situations where without an online service delivery system, a lot of the students that I had worked with probably would have not been able to graduate high school or move on to post high school uh, either training for employment or uh, for higher education at the community college or college level. Online education is an excellent way for some students to get access to the content that they need while at the same time minimizing some of the issues that cause them rather significant stress and concern in a face-to-face -face environment. So although we're looking at this from oh my gosh, here are all the challenges that are occurring with the provision of special ed and, and online environments. I really think that we have to be cautious and careful not to lose sight of the fact that there are an awful lot of students out there who are actually getting more appropriate resources and the provision of resources and services than they might have and given in an online, or pardon me, in a face-to-face -face environment. And that could be due to a number of things. But for the ones I'm talking about, it's because their learning needs are better facilitated by a online synchronous or asynchronous environment as opposed to a face-to-face -to -face environment. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Yeah, if there are no more questions, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up. But if you do have any further questions, please feel free to post in the chat window there. And I will go ahead and wrap us up with a few slides just to close us out. Uh, we just want to yeah, and feel free to email me if you have any additional questions after this as well. You, you can Google me, I'm sure. That's easy. Yeah, if any of our presenters want to include any um, contact information in the chat window, feel free. Uh, Dennis, the report is not yet online. Um, I believe some of my colleagues ha are probably working more closely with this report uh, and probably know more about its status. Um, but uh, I don't believe it has yet been posted. Um, the recording for this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel, however, uh, so you could probably expect that to be posted in the next couple days. Just wanted to make mention of a couple MVLRI initiatives before we wrap up. Um, apologize for the formatting on this slide. I'm not sure what happened with our text, but uh, we do have a podcast series, which we call Virtual Viewpoints, uh, where we talk to different leaders in policy and practice research all around the country who are involved in K-12 online and blended learning. Um, our episodes are hosted at our SoundCloud channel, which you can check out by clicking that link there. And if you're interested in sharing uh, your own story about your own organization or your own work, I'd be happy to talk with you about being a guest on the podcast as well. So please feel free to reach out. We also have our MVLRI blog, uh, which you can visit us at mvlri.org slash research slash blog. And that's where we publish uh, kind of smaller pieces that don't necessarily um, merit having a full-blown publication, but we do have different research efforts. We have guest bloggers come in from all around the country to share the work that they're doing as well. So you can check out our blog by going to the link that's posted there. 
Uh, we also have a webinar upcoming next week. We'll be talking about the impact of student, instructor, and course level factors on learning and online English language courses, and will be hosted by Ben Ben Zhang from Michigan State University, one of our uh, fellows here at MVLRI. And we'll be logging in at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, at the same URL, connect.miv.org slash MVLRI. And lastly, if you'd like to keep in touch with us in the meantime, you can reach out to us at our email address, which is listed there. You can sign up for our email list to get regular updates about the work that we're doing, including our publications, podcasts, webinars, uh, and, and as well as highlighting work of others in the field around the country. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, at MVLRI, or sorry, MVLR Institute, and you can visit our YouTube channel to see all the recordings of the prior webinars that we've done. And like I mentioned earlier, we will be hosting the recording of this webinar within the next 24 hours or so on our YouTube channel. And to check out all of the kind of comprehensive uh, descriptions and recordings of all of our webinars, you can visit the, the webinars section of our webpage as well. So with that, I will close this out. Thank you again to our presenters for a very informative presentation today. Thank you to all of our attendees for engaging in a lively discussion, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your week. Take care.